exploring the, these um, terms that have been used, the, the really uh, loaded uh, language that is used to uh, referring to immigrants uh, in general, uh, specifically uh, terms like illegal, uh, alien, and anchor baby, and so on. Um, and also uh, talking about what kinds of reporting is out there that is uh, trying to counter this and um, what are the consequences, what's the impact of that type of reporting, and most importantly, uh, what's the grassroots response and what kinds of grassroots campaigns have there been um, in motion uh, for a while. And you might be familiar with uh, the Basta Dobbs campaign uh, that um, got Dobbs basically out of his position at CNN. Um, and uh, a lot of the activism that has come from youth themselves uh, and how media is utilized in, in these campaigns. So when we think about the, the rhetoric that um, we're going to be talking about, we often can go straight to thinking about, for example, Glenn Beck or Lou Dobbs, so saying. But the implications of, of other uh, journalists and other publications are also just as loaded. So we're not just kind of uh, doing uh, what we can do really easily, which is like go to the far right and see what these people are saying, but also in the type of publications that we rely, so left-leaning publications, progressive publications, and liberal publications like the New York Times, even when they're trying to report on the issue of immigration and they're trying to shed some light on the complexities of immigration, they still rely on certain terminology that dehumanizes um, immigrants in this country. So we have with us today a really amazing panel of folks here that represent all these different uh, types of work um, that I mentioned in the beginning. And uh, to start us off, we have, uh, I guess I'll just introduce you in order as you're sitting. Uh, Isabel McDonald, who is a journalist and who um, has been, and what is the former director of FAIR, the Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which is the media watchdog. Um, that's been around for a long time. And she's also the one who broke the story about um, Lou Dobbs' connection to immigrant, uh, undocumented immigrant workers, and um, something that he'd been denying and that he'd used as arsenal to kind of manifest this hate against immigrants and uh, also like you know, promote and, and, and uh, defend all the different policies that have been going on. Um, and then we have Julie Holler, who is the managing editor of Extra, um, also a magazine of the Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting uh, Media Watchdog, um, and whose latest piece also addresses some of these uh, terms and uh, the different ways that people have been using these terms. And then we have with us uh, Monica Noa, who is, uh, uh, she's been leading a campaign uh, called Drop the I Word, I Standing for Illegal. And she is with the Applied Research Center, which is a racial justice uh, research center slash think tank. I don't know if you use that term, but um, uh, that uses media also a lot, different types of multimedia to uh, kind of make sure that the work gets disseminated. Uh, then we have Esther Kaplan, who is uh, the director, I have to read this, the director of the Nation Institute um, Research Fund, am I right? Investigative. Uh, investigative fund, and uh, her work has appeared in uh, The Nation, The American Prospect in these times, and she's also one of uh, the hosts of BAI's Beyond the Pale, and uh, then we have with us uh, Sonia, I need to look at your last name, uh, Ginan Saka, who is a, a dreamer activist, meaning uh, who's been an activist with the Dream Act, um, and uh, she is a core member of uh, the New York State uh, Youth Leadership Council and has been also really involved in this media campaign that has taken a national uh, force and it's called um, Undocumented, um, it's a coming out campaign for undocumented uh, young uh, immigrants. Um, and, and the uh, tagline is undocumented, uh, unapologetic, and unafraid, uh, which is a really, really interesting tactic. 
So to start us off, uh, I want to pass the word to Julie Holler, who wrote this piece, and, and she's going to give us the landscape of what types of reporting exists out there, especially given the current climate, um, the legislative climate as well, um, and this piece that she just uh, published. Thank you, Denise. Um, so hopefully everyone got a copy of this, of our magazine Extra. Um, this is our current issue. It's the one that has my article in it. So. Maybe not now, but in a little bit. After the, after the panel's over, you can you can read it, and I am going to refer to it in my very brief comments. Um, so FAIR has been around for 25 years. This is our 25th anniversary year. Um, and we are, are basic, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, I'm going to give you like the 30-second rundown of our critique of the media, which is a structural critique. Um, it's the, 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 the fundamental problem with the media is the corporate ownership and sponsorship. Um, what that means is that you have a very narrow range of debate. Um, media are, corporate media are willing to air the views of those who will not rock the boat too much. Um, sensationalism is okay because that doesn't disturb corporate interests too much, but it, once you start talking about progressive voices and things like that, you start to have issues. Um, and so what this means is that you have a very, a very narrow range of voices and it's uh, predominantly elites and a lot of politicians. Um, you may recall in the run-up to the Iraq War that there, while the majority of Trevor, everyone could silence their phones. Mm -hmm. really good. Even the funky okay. phone. <laughs> oh, we'll make an exception for that. Yeah. So the run-up to the Iraq War, when the majority, a majority of the public, did not support the invasion, um, you may have noticed that there was virtually no debate in the media. And um, after the fact, Washington Post columnist David Ignatius wrote a column saying, you know, because there was, there was some pushback on that, saying, why was there no debate? And he wrote a column basically saying, you know what, it's not our fault. The Republicans and the Democrats, neither of them were really opposing this. And it wasn't our place to, it, to um, create a debate where one did not exist. Hmm. So, just to sort of give you the, that that is an example of the way that the agenda is set um, for corporate media, which I think then leads us into immigration pretty well. Because, you know, in the eight years that I've been at FAIR, I notice there's definitely cycles with immigration coverage. And sometimes it's very prominent and sometimes it's completely missing. And you notice also that it tends to be very correlated to election cycles. Um, and political context. And it's about when politicians are interested in talking about immigration <coughs> that it mostly comes up. Um, and it's when politicians find immigration as a useful tool. That tends to be Republicans who find immigration a useful tool to peel off um, white voters from the Democratic base by using racism and xenophobia. So this is the seed or the root of um, the immigration coverage that you will often get in the corporate media. And so this is also <coughs> where you end up with um, this kind of rhetoric, like you know, using the word illegal, um, anchor babies, the sort of the rhetoric du jour, um, and then this concept of drop and leave, all of which I, I talk about in, in my article because they've all been rather prominent in the last six months or so. Um, and I think, you know, specifically thinking about anchor babies, um, that is a concept, that's a, that's a term that has been around for more than 15 years and being pushed by the other fair, the evil fair, <laughs> um, Federation for American Immigration Reform, uh, which is a very prominent, if, you, if you're in this workshop, you're probably familiar with them. Um, they've been around for a very long time pushing an anti-immigration campaign and they're, they're very well liked by the media. Um, they, they get into the media all the time as spokespeople. Um, so FAIR and also some other politicians um, more than 15 years ago were pushing anchor babies as a concept. And it didn't gain, it gained a little bit of traction here and there, as I said, like during certain cycles. But I think you, the reason why you see a, an upsurge recently is for two reasons. One is the, um, the political context, as I was talking about. Um, but particularly right now when you have Republicans out of power, um, a black man as president, and an economic crisis, you have sort of a perfect storm for uh, racism and xenophobia in, on the right and then in the media. 
And I also think that um, the rise of Fox News has, has had a major impact. Uh, even just five years ago, Fox was not the number one cable news network, and a lot of people thought that it never would be. Um, but Fox is now the number one cable network, and it does have a lot of impact. Uh, it reaches a lot of people, and, and it's not just Fox. Obviously, there's a whole range of radio stations and blogs and um, other sorts of small publications that have created a very big e echo chamber for FAIR, groups like FAIR, um, and for these right-wing politicians that are using this rhetoric. Um, so that's where you see, it's in the right-wing media that you see the use of these kinds of terms, primarily, without any sort of critique, without any sort of self-critique on their part. Um, then, so, so now I, I sort of want to move into this idea that there's different kinds, there's different ways that this rhetoric plays out. So you've got first the sort of, we'll call it the Fox style, and then you have what I'll call CNN style. Um, so CNN style, I, I have a really great example in my article in this issue. This was um, on CNN in December when CNN's Kieran Chetri and Time editor-at-large Belinda Luscombe were talking about the top 10 buzzwords of 2010. And so Luscombe says, this is, a, this is a quote, I'm not lying. Anchor baby is also another one. A baby is a fragile thing, an anchor is a robust, heavy thing. You put those together and you have a whole new concept. And Chetri's response is, that's right. Um, it's just <laughs> utterly inane, it's ridiculous. And, but the point is, there's no context given and there's no sort of judgment passed on this. It's completely, devoid of any sort of, um, anything that can help you think about the word or what it means, or the term, I should say. Um, and this is, this is really typical of, of a lot of coverage is that they can say, oh, well, you know, we're not, we're not saying that we necessarily approve of this word, um, but they're also not giving you any sort of context. And so you get a normalization of that kind of language. Um, then you also have New York Times style, uh, which is also, I'm gonna take an example from my piece, uh, a January article that appeared on the front page of the New York Times. I'm gonna read you the opening paragraph from that article. <clears throat> of the 50 or so women bussed to this border town on a recent morning to be deported back to Mexico, Inez Vasquez stood out. Eight months pregnant, she had tried to trudge north in her fragile state, even carrying scissors with her in case she gave birth in the desert and had to cut the umbilical cord. Now, in this article, the reporter notes that that Inez Vasquez is a very rare case. She's not at all typical. Um, and they also point out that uh, most people who cross the border do so for <coughs> work and not in order to have babies that will have citizenship. So, you know, you have the context given, you have the facts given, but you have a framing that completely undermines those door. facts and that context. And so, again, even though you have that, you still have the normalization because of that framing. Um, and so, you know, as Denise was saying in her introduction, yes, there's a problem with Fox um, and that style, but there's, it's also really important to be very aware of the insidious ways that this comes through in all sorts of media. Um, and so I just wanna then close with two sort of, two responses. Um, that I have to this, and that is sort of the, the response that we have it fair to, to these sorts of things given the, the context that we're in, the corporate media context. And one is that it is very important to talk back to the media. And so, you know, we have other people who are gonna be talking about campaigns against Dobbs at CNN and against other uh, corporate outlets. And that's absolutely critical. Um, there also are limitations to it because of the, struct the, uh, the structure of this. And so you have to recognize that Fox News has a very successful business model and they are not going to change. It's very unlikely that they are going to change anytime soon, no matter what kind of activism we do. Um, and therefore I also, my second point is that it's critical at the same time to be supporting um, alternative media that do understand these issues and that do present that can, that can act as sort of a counterbalance to Fox News. You know, they have their side. We have to be able to, we really have to support the, the different media that do a good job and we have to build up alternative media. How do we support them by themselves? 
Maybe we'll wait. We'll, for, we'll wait for a let everyone else here speak before we <laughs> yeah. But I just wanted to say also like in terms of supporting, like it's also about holding accountable our media because then things go completely unchecked. So we just realize that you know the normalization of these terms just is part of, it's just really pervasive. Absolutely. Um, so support and, and, and part of that support. And educate also, and yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. and hold their feet to the fire. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Monica Navoa. I kind of want to get a sense for the room. Um, to, so that I can kind of alter the message depending on who's in here. Do we have media in the room? Anyone from media? Um, anyone working on immigrant rights or in solidarity with immigrant rights? Okay. Um, but I think that <coughs> those are the two things that I wanted to know most. Uh, it makes me happy that we have folks in here that aren't representing either. I wish media and immigrant rights folks were here, but this means that we're reaching a new audience with our message, so that makes me really happy. Um, have any of you heard of the Drop the I Word campaign? You have? Okay. Um, so the Drop the I Word campaign is presented by the Applied Research Center and ColorLines.com. Um, Applied Research Center publishes ColorLines.com. Um, Applied Research Center is a, a racial justice think tank, and um, ColorLines looks at the news through a racial lens. Um, so that's what we do. And we, we prepare people to make racial justice. So Drop the I Word um, has a lot of different um, there are a lot of different historical convergences and racial justice is just one of those. Um, and what we mean by that with the Drop the I Word campaign is that the use of the term illegals is used primarily to discriminate against um, and to um, excuse violence against and violent policies against people of color. Um, if you, when we talk about illegals, we're not talking about Canadians. We're not talking about European immigrants. We're talking about people of color. This is also really you know, related to Islamophobia. Um, it's the reason why um, Mexican people from the West Coast to the East Coast are dis discriminated against and why um, uh, other Latinos and people of color are um, discriminated, discriminated against as well. Um, drop the I word. I have to say that at Applied Research Center, we pay very <coughs> close attention to language and media and how that's impacted um, the immigrant rights movement in recent years. Um, and so even looking at comprehensive immigration reform, for instance, it was, it was never something that we felt that we could get behind because it kind of papered over the root issues. So we were never really talking about anything comprehensive that was to the benefit of immigrants, <coughs> right? It was um, heavily about enforcement, um, about criminalization of people, about locking people up, um, about detaining them, about increased border deaths, um, and about an incredibly inhumane system that kind of really makes us think about the values that this country holds and just our human rights record. It's um, a complete atrocity, right? Um, so first and foremost, the word illegals, and the word illegals is really just shorthand for illegal alien, illegal immigrant, um, any of those terms. Uh, at the root of that is also the term anchor baby. Um, so it's, it's, it's racist, um, it's completely inhumane, right? Um, I think a lot of you may have heard of um, state, Kansas State Senator Peck this week. Um, he talked about how, he, they were in a meeting talking about how to deal with like feral hogs and how to shoot them or whatever. And he talked about how um, maybe that was the solution to deal with the illegal immigrant problem, was to shoot people from helicopters. So that, that was horrible, but I'll tell you what else was really horrible was there was some media coverage that um, kind of condemned the statement and they were like, that's horrible. How could he talk that way about illegal immigrants? So it's kind of like, well, He's talking that way about illegal immigrants because we're talking about folks as illegals. And so to begin with, he feels, he felt at ease matter-of-factly proposing that because he wasn't talking about humans. He was talking about people who were framed as less than human. Um, so we kind of look at that and then even the apology, I don't know if any of you saw the apology that came from, from the House leadership. It was very like canned, like 
oh, we're sorry he said that. You know, he's sorry, we accept his apology, and we're just gonna move on from here. He's not gonna do it again. So nowhere in that acceptance of that apology was any mention about how, how dangerous the word is, what it does to communities, um, how it's at the root of um, anti-immigrant hate crimes, at the root of anti-immigrant policy, and at the root of something that's really putting a terrible stain on our country. So that they didn't acknowledge that at all. So that's kind of, that's, we're looking at something that's very inhumane. Um, it's also very inaccurate, which is, some, which is probably the most confusing part about the word for people. Um, the Society of Hispanic, um, no, the Society of Professional Journalists um, has a diversity committee. And within that committee, they've been talking about um, pro proposing for journal, and the, the SHP, the, whatever the initials SPJ. are, SPJ. Um, there's some contention about the language there, um, but the fight is kind of being led by um, an attorney. And his point of view is that the word negates due process. And we believe that as well. Um, some folks who are talking about the fight will say, well, um, you know, you wouldn't call someone illegal who's just crossing the street and is a jaywalker and will get a ticket. I really, I really don't talk about it in that way because um, there are some immigrants that have been convicted of crimes and they also deserve, like, you know, their humanity and their dignity to be respected too. I mean, people pay for whatever they do and we can move on from there. Um, back, uh, I guess, five or six years ago, one of the big things that was s kind of creating divisions within immigrant rights, um, folks who were working on media or language or whatever, was that, that people were being pinned against <coughs> each other, like, I, you know, I, I am not a criminal. Well, guess what? Some people are framed that way in our society, but they deserve a chance. So I just like to mention that because it's something I, I really um, so, so when we look at language, it's a matter of life and death right now. Um, at the height of um, last summer, you know, when SB 1070 was 24-7 on the news, um, during that summer there was a huge spike in hate crimes against Latinos across the country. Um, you all may be familiar with a crime that happened not too far from here in Long Island in 2008. Um, Marcelo Lucero was walking with his friend Angel Loja they were approached by teenagers. Um, they had some words back and forth, and Marcelo was stabbed to death. But before he was stabbed to death, these kids, teenagers, said something very horrible. It, it, it's hard for me to say it, but um, I think people need to hear it. Um, he said, um, hey, fucking nigger, fucking Mexican, fucking illegals, you come here and you take our jobs, right? Um, and that, that's pretty intense, um, but it points, it points to, it points to the racism, it points to how inhumane it is, and it also points to our history. Um, any, you know, any messed up language or any marginalization of any group has always been preceded by really messed up language. Um, do any of you know what the Chinese Exclusion Act is or what it did? Right? So in 1882, this was passed, um, and hundreds, if not thousands, I would need to wiki that, but um, people um, of Chinese descent and Chinese people were sent back to China after having worked on our railroads. Um, prior to that act passing, um, the media used the term chink a lot, um, and they talked about yellow fever a lot. And, and so you look at how that's related. We're talking about so-called liberal or progressive outlets as well. Um, you know, when the campaign launched, we ran into a couple of snags <laughs> um, that we kind of were, hi, we kind of were prepared for, but we were really surprised, right? Um, so, Ezra Klein, who you all may read, he blogs at the Washington Post on economics Sorry. and all sorts of things. Um, he said that he wouldn't drop the use of the I word because it was papering over um, the law breaking 
and that, you know, this is actually an issue that needs to be addressed. And I think that that point of view is something that someone who will, who's looking closely at policy and what our foreign policy is, at all of the push and pull factors for immigration, you don't say irresponsible things like that, right? But that's, if you're asking, what I'm, I'm hoping that you leave from here and you drop the I word and you ask your friends to do that. And one of the things that they may tell you is that, well, you're still breaking the law. Um, and what we say to that is that there, there have been incredibly inhumane laws throughout our history. Um, and what this campaign is trying to do is put people first, put human beings first. So if the law is inhumane, then we need to take a second look at it. The problem is, is that with this word, it doesn't really, it's kind of a conversation stopper. Mm -hmm. Because when you're talking about people as illegals, then you're like, oh, well, you know, immediately that's, that's the law. It really stops conversation. And the conversations that we need to be having are much broader. They cannot be contained in one word. Um, there probably isn't any one word that could describe all of the different reasons why people fall out of status or come to this country. And that's very important to recognize. Um, at Color Lines, we say immigrants without papers. We say undocumented. Um, sometimes we say unauthorized. Um, we say foreign nationals. We describe where a person is from. Um, but we do not use illegals. We do not use Ill illegal immigrant. Uh, the Associated Press, which dictates um, how papers should write, uses illegal immigrants currently. Um, this campaign will address that eventually because that's, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so I, you can text now if you take your phone out. You can text the word I word to 69866. Um, or you can go to our campaign website. It's dropthe-i-word.com, um, and you can pledge there. We're we're really looking to raise pledges right now because the AP and other folks, in order to put pressure on them, they need to see where this is coming from. Um, and I I like to also say that we're we're taking the lead from immigrants um, and from undocumented immigrants. Um, one of the things that we really want to do with this campaign is give the platform um, for people to hear from those who are most affected. Uh, the idea for this campaign is not completely new. Um, back in the 80s, when um, the sanctuary movement started, actually started 29 years ago this month, um, in honor of Monsignor Romero, um, who was a Salvadoran martyr of that civil war. Um, so people took his inspiration and they, um, they came out as undocumented to congregations, community centers, schools, <coughs> um, different places um, to, to get to a more humane immigration reform. It was immigrant-led. Um, and that's kind of where we are right now. Um, there, there are people in this country who come from rich, um, organizing legacies in their home countries. So this didn't all, for us, start with, you know, like moveon.org. It's online organizing, but we're looking at online and offline as well, because without the offline, then it's like, what are we doing with it? So, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, um, I'm Isabel, for anybody who came in late, and I, the way that I was introduced was that I had I wrote an article last year for The Nation magazine exposing mm -hmm. former CNN host Lou Dobbs' ties with undocumented workers. So Dobbs, more than any other media figure in the US, was really an emblem of this very hardline approach to tougher enforcement of inhumane immigration laws. He almost every night would go on about illegals and the supposed threat they posed to Americans' jobs, to um, health. He invented all kinds of phony, um, phony smears against immigrants, um, blamed undocumented immigrants for bringing leprosy, um, <coughs> which was completely, uh, was revealed to be completely false. He invented a, an imaginary leprosy epidemic, which he blamed on undocumented immigrants. And his platform was not Fox News, it was CNN and he had his own show for years. It was on 
every, every night, often talking about illegals. And I think it's very, when we're facing such a huge problem as corporate media coverage of immigration, it's very important for us to take stock of victories. And I think one of the big victories we have seen over the past year and a half is Dobbs having lost his platform on CNN. For years, organizations like FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, the non-evil FAIR, had documented these erroneous claims like the leprosy, supposed leprosy ep epidemic, um, like the false information linking, link, linking undocumented immigration with violent crime <coughs> that Dobbs had been responsible for advancing. This had been, so Dobbs' record of inaccuracy had been heavily documented um, by groups like FAIR and others, and what, ha what, was, what happened that was quite extraordinary, a year, it was the fall of, the, in the fall of 2009, was that we saw a campaign led by Latino groups called Basta Dobbs that was able to generate sufficient pressure on CNN um, to force Dobbs off the air. CNN doesn't acknowledge that Dobbs was fired. Nobody will publicly say that Dobbs was fired, but he was paid $8 million to leave the network in the wake of this campaign. And so it was, it was led by Presente, which is a, a national Latino advocacy group, and a num uh, dozens of other dozens of other groups. Some of them um, very very some of them really grassroots groups from across the country. And simultaneously, this campaign um, was joined with by a complementary <coughs> campaign in which um, Media Matters for America, which is, which is another media watch group, and a number of a number of DC-based immigration reform groups joined in, all putting pressure on CNN to get Dobbs off of the air. And it succeeded. Um, and I think a couple, I, so I'd like to just talk about a, a few things that I think led to that success. Um, one of them was a very, very smart timing on the part of the organizers. <coughs> CNN in the fall of 2009 came out with this series called Latino in America that was, they'd have previously had a series called Black in America. Mm -hmm. And so it was basically um, sh CNN's efforts to reach out to this growing constituency of Latinos in this country and show people their <coughs> own lives reflected in CNN programming. So Presente and the other groups who were part of this, cam this campaign, Basta Dobbs, seized on this and created a video in which they spliced together Dobbs making these really hateful comments about immigrants, and especially Latinos, with the promo material that CNN was putting out about Latino in America. And they made it go viral. And simultaneously, there was this, this petition to CNN, an online petition to CNN, and it got um, huge numbers of signatures very, very, very quickly. There were protests organized in, um, I think Monica was quite close to this campaign and can talk more about it, but my understanding is that there were, camp there were protests organized in 18, I think there were, originally it was gonna be 25 cities, but there were at least 18 cities that had these, these protests in them outside of CNN studios, mm -hmm. saying, CNN, you can't have it both ways. Either you want to represent Latinos, or you don't, and you can't have Dobbs and, and, and the series at the same time, it makes no sense. And so Dobbs lost his nightly platform on CNN, which was momentous. His last night on CNN, where he announced that he was, he was no longer going to have his program, he said that he, had, he, he was leaving because people had approached him suggesting that he had some sort of higher calling. <laughs> and so immediately, the media started speculating about how he was probably going to run for political office. And Dobbs kept this alive. Um, and as recently as March 2009, had told Sean Hannity when he, he, he was, after his, he'd lost his perch at CNN, he continued to make regular cable news appearances. And he also kept his nationally syndicated radio show. So it's not like this man had no media media outlets to, to, to speak in anymore. 
he still had a significant he still has a significant perch in the media, but he basically he said to Sean Hannity that he had not ruled out the idea of running for the presidency or for Senate in the 2012 election. And um, my research into Dobbs' ties with undocumented immigrants started in the fall of 2009 while the Basta Dobbs campaign was in, was in full swing. And this was not a coincidence. This was, I think, something that we can really learn from as, as independent, independent journalists, as activists on the left. The way that campaigns can be organized with an eye to investigative journalism that could complement that work. Um, and this work often would need to be done by different people. The standards of investigative journalism need to be very rigorous for, for, um, for journalism to make an impact politically. But what we see on the right is that there is often a great coordination of um, different groups who are able to work together effectively to push agendas. And I think on the left, we're often working in a very fragmented way and often reacting. So we will organize campaigns in reaction to some terrible event or terrible legislation. Um, but people who were involved with the Basta Dobbs campaign saw that there was an extraordinary opportunity created by the contradictions of the immigration debate itself. Because somebody like Dobbs, who makes millions of dollars a year, spewing venom about immigrants, unfortunately, is exactly the kind of person who is most reliant on <coughs> undocumented immigrants. It was already well established before 2009 that Dobbs and his family kept um, a huge number of horses, dozens of horses. Horses are very labor intensive and the horse industry is filled with undocumented workers. Dobbs also has extensive property, both in New Jersey and in Florida, has acres and acres of, of land. And so, of course, who looks after the land? Who, who does landscaping? Most of the time, there will be undocumented, undocumented workers involved in, in landscaping. If you go to a state like Florida, if you go into the degaded communities where Dobbs has property, a lot of the work is done by undocumented Latin American immigrants. And so there was this extraordinary opportunity for an investigation to happen. Um, it, there had already been attempts by corporate media outlets. When I first started the research into Dobbs' ties with undocumented immigrants, I <coughs> was doing some online research, just looking at what had been written already. And I found very early, this was, it was, um, the, I think it was about October of <coughs> 2009, before Dobbs had stepped down from CNN, I heard Dobbs on his radio show talking about how there had been a New York Post reporter who was snooping <coughs> around his property in New Jersey, asking his neighbors if they had seen any immigrant, Latin American immigrants <coughs> who worked on Dobbs's property. So this is an example of an investigation conducted by <coughs> a reporter at a journalist, a, a, a reporter at a media outlet that is owned by Rupert Murdoch, <coughs> who has about zero commitment to proper investigative journalism, which requires a lot of time so that you can do your work in a subtle way and not get exposed on day one. And so that report, that wrote, that what could have been an investigative report on Dobbs' ties with undocumented immigrants by the New York Post was blown out of the water because the journalist had insufficient time and, and was, was not able to really go at it and with, with the methods that were required. Um, there had, I learned over the course of my investigation that there had also been um, a journalist from Newsday who had been doing a similar investigation and had made contact with some immigrant rights groups in New Jersey long before um, Basta Dobbs and long before the New York Post got in, interested. So there had been these fledgling attempts and it was recognized by one of the key organizers of Basta Dobbs, Roberto Lovato, that this would be an extraordinary story. He, so he had already been in discussion with the Nation Institute about the idea, and it was, I think, has, as an idea, it seemed to, I mean, it even appealed to the New York Post. So there was already some, some interest in the idea, 
and I heard about it while this campaign was in was in full swing, and was and I mean remain very impressed at the foresight that people involved with this campaign had in terms of what would make this what would make our cam campaign more effective is if somebody did this necessary investigation, looking at the ties between Lou Dobbs and undocumented immigrants. We know all of us have ties with undocumented workers because this is the reality of our economy. And so it just, it just required time and a commitment of resources to, to get that story. So I began this, began this piece that could have been useful in the Busted Dogs campaign, but in the end, <coughs> they managed to get rid of Dogs without, without my report, which came out a full year after Dogs had left CNN. Um, and in doing, in doing the research, I mean, what really, what really broke the story was the fact that there were five undocumented immigrants who very courageously agreed to speak to me. They didn't give their, their real names for publication because that would, they were already facing a huge risk and taking, taking a huge risk in speaking to me. But they agreed to be quoted in my article talking about how they had, in, in all cases for at least a year, in some cases for many years, cared for Dobbs's either horses or the grounds of his estate. And they even, uh, two of them even agreed to um, go on camera, not their faces, but just their hands, explaining this. And when the story came out, Lou Dobbs tried to, tried to bully the nation in the way that he had succeeded in bullying the New York Post into desisting from the story. Um, I got a call as I was doing my final stages of research and getting quotes from the from the parties who had who would who who had <coughs> from Dobbs's contractors through whom he had hired these undocumented immigrants who alerted Dobbs and so I got a call from Dobbs's producer about an a week before the article was to come out got a call from Dobbs's radio show producer saying Isabel could you come on the air in half an hour to talk about this story you are working on and it wasn't public yet. I said, well, let me get back to you. And so mm -hmm. I ended up saying, I would love to come on as soon as the article is published. And Dobbs refused at that point to even comment for the article. He said, I will only answer your questions on my radio show. He then, I found out, sent an email to the nation asking the nation's editor-in-chief to come on his radio show to talk about the nation's lying reporter who had been doing all kinds of dishonest things to get this story. And so I think there are a few, I think there are a few lessons in this. One is the importance of, the importance of investigative journalism and activist campaigns working hand in hand to be able to have a greater impact. Um, Another lesson for me is the, the importance of having <coughs> independent publications like, like The Nation that are prepared to stand up to the bullying of the likes of Lou Dobbs, and also structures of funding, which Esther can talk about, like The Nation Institute that provided me with funds to be able to pay to go to Florida to investigate the story, to pay to go to Vermont to investigate the story. Dobbs' horses travel every year from Vermont to Florida mm -hmm. in trucks mm -hmm. with the undocumented Mexican workers. And so I had to follow them <laughs> to get the story. Um, and the, the experience of Dobbs, who was on the air on CNN for years talking about um, the ills of illegal employers and illegal workers, while he himself relied on a small army of <laughs> undocumented workers caring for his property. And there was no media outlet <clears throat> that actually succeeded in getting this story. I think it speaks to the failure of the failure of the corporate media, the failure of um, media institutions in the mainstream to invest in the kind of investigative reporting that actually makes for quite good stories. When the piece came out, I was on Dobbs's radio show, we ended up Go, dip, going head to head on MSNBC, on ABC, Good Morning America, like it, and I think it's a lesson that that I mean, first of all, activist campaigns like Busted Dogs can really get results, mm -hmm. 
and also that investigative reporting going after some of these these people who have been empowered in the media to speak about immigration day after day after day, we can have some real victories for alternative media and for, and for activist campaigns and for creating different kinds of messages around these, around immigration as a whole, if we combine our resources in the way that I think happened out of the Basta Dobbs campaign, which ultimately sort of <coughs> laid seeds for my investigation. I think that's a good segue into Esther. Um, yeah, um, is, Isabel, I, I guess the two of you organized this panel, Isabel had asked me to speak um, as an editor um, kind of proactively about the kinds of immigration stories we should be doing, but I did want to pick up a little bit on some of the points that Julie made about just the media landscape first. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with uh, the point that you are making that it's all driven by this political cycle. And when John McCain decides immigration is an, is an issue, it will be covered and otherwise. Um, but I think the real, it's important to acknowledge that the, the real crisis in, in journalism coverage of immigration is in the English language media. In the Spanish language media, we actually have the kind of coverage that we want on the whole, um, not universally, uh, but um, the coverage tends to be very sympathetic and it tends to be um, advocating for immigration reform. Um, it's really a crisis of the English language media. And our problem in English language media is the people who are obsessed with immigration all the time <coughs> are the far right. Um, the people who only are obsessed during the campaign cycle are the, what has been termed the, the liberal media. And um, you know, for, for people who don't know, uh, the, the, the Center for Immigration Studies, which is the super right-wing think tank, um, if we can call it thinking, on, on immigration, which, you know, puts <laughs> out, like, study after study after, you know, like, trying constantly to spin this debate in... Which is a branch of the evil fair. Of the evil fair. It's, it's a whole network of... Um, What's the name? Uh, the Center for Immigration Studies. Um, it's kind of like the, you know, the, 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 the Chemical Research Institute and all of these, you know, Front groups that corporate front groups that sound so legitimate, but um, but they're the only ones. For example, um, there's a if you want to subscribe to a journalism listserv that does a roundup of all of journalism coverage, they're the only group that puts one out. So you're getting it through their right wing lens. Um, I recently discovered that the only group that gives out a journalism award for reporting on immigration is this group. So they're a rewarding right wing coverage on immigration. So we have this really disproportionate landscape, again, in the English language media, where the right is obsessed with this issue. They're on it, on it, on it. And the liberal media, including the independent media, unfortunately, on this issue, is kind of interested when it comes up um, in the campaign cycle. And, um, and one of the things that, that Julie didn't mention that I think is crucial in the white media, in the white media, in the uh, English language media, <laughs> which is, is that it is very white. Um, it's overwhelmingly white. I mean, it's a very white, it's not as white a profession as firefighting, but you know, it's, um, it's a very white profession and it's become, you know, it wasn't 100 years ago, but it's become a very bourgeois profession. So we're talking about a media core, reporters and editors, editors being the decision makers, who, are earning upper middle class incomes and living in a white professional world and often in white neighborhoods and it's just not their issue. It is not their issue. And I include much of the independent and progressive media in that. Um, I work on a project called the Investigative Fund. We partner with a lot of different media outlets. We initiate investigative projects and then we're placing them in different outlets. And Immigration stories are not easy to place in the independent progressive media. That's like a yawn. That's a snooze a lot of the time. Again, unless it's got the energy of an election cycle or, you know, some Yahoo in um, Kansas who um, just decided, you know, that, that um, so-called illegals should be shot like pigs from helicopters. Um, so... Uh, but, but I also think it's very, 
crucial, and I think for people who don't work in the media, this is not as, as obvious, that it's not a monolith. I mean, I hope I'm not revealing too much to say that the Basta Dobbs campaign had a lot of aid and assistance from Latino journalists working inside CNN. They were very important sources about who the key decision makers <coughs> were, about the, about on Dobbs' career, um, about when upcoming broadcast dates were, about all kinds of things. They were real allies. And with any media organization, um, excepting those on the far right, there are people within those organizations that can be allies. And it's very important to realize they can even be moles, as in the case of the Boston mm -hmm. Dobbs campaign. I would say that even in Fox, there are people like that. Right. Fewer, much yeah. fewer, but they, they exist. But they exist. And, and it's really important to think of these as complicated structures where there are dissenters inside and think about the opportunities there. Um, so anyway, with that, I will just briefly uh, talk about some kinds of reporting I feel like we need and, and maybe focus in on the kinds of um, uh, reporting that, that, that feed off of what, what Isabel said, which is reporting uh, uh, on, on targets where those same targets can be activist targets at the same time. I think it's, it's really important to, to think that way. Um, I think we need more reporting on on the bad guys. You know, I think we need to be digging up dirt on the hate mongers, and by we I mean activists and journalists. Um, whether they're media figures, whether they're elected officials, whether they're law enforcement, this guy who says that immigrants should be shot like pigs, the the people who are sponsoring these anti-immigrant laws in whether it's Georgia or Utah or Arizona, we need to be. Mm -hmm digging in late at night on the computer, on the phone, and finding out dirt on these people and discrediting them. I don't think we do that enough as activists on the left, and we don't do enough of that as journalists. The Dobbs example is an example of what can happen when journalists and activists decide to take someone down because they've just been spreading hate and they don't deserve to be in their position. Um, I think that um, we need more work on bad companies. Um, it's, I don't know if people remember the huge immigration raid that happened a couple of years back at, in Postville, Iowa. Three years before, PETA had been in those factories reporting on mistreatment of animals, it was kosher, kosher slaughterhouses, reporting on the mistreatment of animals there. Um, and then about a year before the raids, there was a reporter for the Jewish Forward, actually, because they were these kosher plants who was in there reporting on the abuses of the workers. But it was only when he was reporting on the abuses of the workers that he realized PETA had been in these factories again and again, but only reporting on the abuses of animals. And I think there's a lot of, I, I mean, not, not to make a comment about the potential blinders of PETA, but there's actually an interplay here that we, ha we have failed to connect the dots. You know, there's a connection between mistreatment of animals mistreatment of workers, total lack of food safety, um, and companies, you know, that are, that are doing the wrong thing um, for their, uh, in, in terms of their, you know, worker exploitation and undocumented workers being the most exploitable class of workers, obviously. Um, you know, when there's a big spinach recall or poultry yeah. recall or <laughs> hamburger recall, that's a chance to go after that same company for um, how they treat their workers. And those are all immigrant workers, I promise you, and many of them undocumented immigrant workers. And I don't think, I, I say this, you know, I think as activists and as journalists, and I think this was partly Isabel's point, we don't take those moments of opportunity in the way that we should, in the way that the right knows how, the minute, you know, James O'Keefe gets his video of Acorn, they know how to do the main, <laughs> the, 360 degree pylon and take down an organization, whether it's from their media arm or their activist arm, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of missed opportunities, I think, about where we could be looking at things, both as reporters and as activists, in a way that could really, um, you know, put these pieces together. Uh, I, I also, um, and I, I will close because I actually, mm -hmm. My big thrill about being on this panel, panel is to meet Sonia because I think along with the uprisings in Egypt and Wisconsin, the, the 
the actions of the DREAM Act protesters were one of the greatest things to happen this past year, and one of the hugest <coughs> sources of encouragement. But I do want to say, editing stories about undocumented workers, working with Isabel, working with our Bogatas in the back here, and other reporters who've been doing this great work, talking with undocumented workers, trying to tell their stories, <coughs> is it's really struck me how much the fear um, that undocumented workers live under, the fragility of their lives, the incredible risks that they have to take to talk to journalists, is deeply affecting the coverage we get. You know, we have a broadcast world in which, again, the right-wingers are obsessing and hammering on <coughs> illegals, I say the term advisedly, every day, and undocumented workers can't get on the camera and respond, have traditionally not felt safe enough, have felt like the risks were too high. And I don't think we really appreciate how profound that is in terms of the overall immigration debate, the people being debated. We don't see their faces. We don't see their faces. And this is a really important part, I think, as activists and journalists, and this is why it was so revolutionary Mm -hmm. this, this movement of the dream actors to decide, screw it. You know, we're, what was your slogan? Unapologetic, unafraid. That's really tough. I'm sure you were afraid, actually. But it's acting unafraid, even when you're afraid. And I feel like, um, you know, I was talking with a, a friend the other day who was talking about the parallels between, you know, the, the civil rights movement and, um, and the immigrant rights movement. And... You know, we have, you know, our, our equivalent of Bull Connor, you know, in Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Arizona. You know, we, we have our equi equivalent of Wallace, you know, in, in Governor Brewer in Arizona. But where's, you know, our, equi our equivalent of Fannie Lou Hamer? Where's our equivalent, um, you know, Bayard Rustin? Where, where we, we aren't hearing about the leaders of this movement. They aren't being elevated as heroes. Um, we don't have, in general, there's like a massive debate going on in this country about a movement, about a community, about a population, and there aren't faces there. And we desperately need to tell those stories um, and to, to, to embody them. <laughs> um, and with that, I will, I will stop and turn it over to Sonia. Let's take this a few years ago. Not many people, even if they were undocumented, people here would be able to raise their hands. And I probably raised my hands. Mm -hmm. I am undocumented. I came here at the age of five. I came from Ecuador. I grew up in Harlem. Uh, Excel was number five in my graduate class. And then the issue of the nine digit numbers hit me. Because of those lack of numbers, mm -hmm. my career, the way I'm described in media, the way I am portrayed in media, the way I live has been in fear. And I quote fear because I think we live in this shadow where everybody's talking about us. You know, media can sit here and talk about debate and politicians can, you know, stand up in our behalf or stand against us. But like she said, there's always been, where is undocumented? Why? What would happen with them? It is not because they have they lack agency. It is because we live in a culture where it is taboo to talk about our immigration status. We are sh are ashamed. We are told that we are less. And if we do come out, um, you go to an article. The comments, the hateful comments, will make make you not come out anymore. But my presence being here is, as many of you have seen during the Dream Act campaign, during last year's campaign. Well, DreamHack has been around since 2001. And at the forefront, it has been undocumented youth who have been saying enough is enough. And we have been going back and forth with politicians who still use the legal word to, I guess, petition on our behalf. And it shouldn't be that way because it dehumanizes us. It doesn't address the issue. It, once again, pinpoint us as breaking the law. Um, and like Monica said, there has been many laws that have been really, really very detrimental to our community and society. You want to go back to prior to Brown versus Board of Ed. You know, not 
allowing black students to be in the classroom with white students. And now we see that in Georgia, where undocumented students cannot go to college. So when we think about this stuff, we have to say, it is not because undocumented people are lacking agency, it is because where we're living, in the conditions that we are pinpointed to. So as the Rise of Dream Act, um, the vote of last, um, last December, we have, seen, we have seen and we have stood up as empowering our communities to come out, out of the shadows. And that by itself acknowledges the fact that we're human beings. And that this is not statistics, this is not all just immigrants. The topic that is being addressed is human beings. So if you want to apply a law, a solution, you have to treat people like human beings. You have to acknowledge them and describe them as human beings. So um, going back to the Dream Act campaign, it has been led by grassroots organi organizations, students, um, people who cannot go to college, people who have aged out, people who are 30 years old, grandparents, parents, teachers, professors, allies, who are at the forefront saying, you know, we're coming out undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. Um, and I think one of the things I wanted to mention is that at the end of the day, you know, everybody can debate about the immigration issue, but it is the, the courageous coming out stories of not just mine, but the many of the stories that are coming out every day from across the states. So from Florida to Detroit to Texas, we are coming out, and I think that is something that has to be acknowledged um, because we're not afraid, and we're here, and we want to address the issue, and nobody's talking in our behalf. We're here. Um, and that's one of the things I wanted to say, in addition to saying that I'm asking you, all of you who are here, if you know friends or if you yourself use the word illegal, to stop using it because you're describing me. So um, I don't know how we're going to say it. <laughs> but that's pretty much I wanted to say that. for undocumented youth. So across the country, undocumented youth have come out uh, as undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. And this is our second year doing this. Um, and there's much to come. So look out for that. Yeah, maybe that's a good segue. I'll just pose a question, and, and, and then we can open it up um, for everyone. But I mean, the question of, because the way that you're coming out is both through text and through video. So people mm -hmm. are actually showing their face publicly through YouTube and all these different channels. First and, and last name. For everybody. First and last name, exactly. Um, so I'm wondering, like, in terms of that tactic and, and the repercussions of that tactic, um, and the use of these types of tools, of media tools, like what kinds of conversations are happening there in terms of you know the, the unfearful part of it, which I think is, is like you said, that's a really revolutionary. Um, but what does that mean in terms of having these platforms to distribute your message? I think at the beginning, I've always, when we come out undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic, or just undocumented, period, um, is media is always like, you know, can we use your first name? Do you want me to take a picture of you? Um, and I guess it's because we're, we still portray the fact that we should be scared about something. Um, and there's repercussions. Um, they could be, you know, raiding your house. They can be something. We, this any of Flores, this is, you know, um, she was not undocumented, but she was an immigrant, and look what happened to her. Um, in the EVO, like even in Dream Act, when Can you they explain what happened to her? Because I don't know if... Oh, Brisani Flores, um, I don't know, Monica, do you want to... Um, she, um, Brisani Flores and her father were murdered, I do not remember the year, a few years ago in Arizona. Um, it was something that was done by Minutemen people. Um, Shauna Ford, I think may, may, you guys may have heard of that trial that just recently happened. And so... Um, it's kind of looking looking at the rhetoric, looking at the extremists that it spawns and, and these violent acts. Yeah, so when things like this come up, when media want to cover cover like stories of undocumented people, it always has been, you know, no, no picture. Um, 
no last uh, fake name um, and I understand because you know we live in fear we my parents will not come out with pictures they will lose their jobs they will you know be taunt at work or in the streets um, let alone sharing a story like that it's really really like personal um, I think so putting ourselves in that platform is understanding that this is not like <laughs> our fault that is like a structure issue that is an immigration system that has been broken and ridiculously like unjust um, so coming out with first and last name or coming out with pictures or in videos has made um, the immigration issue a personal and very humane issue um, so portraying people as people and not as just a word uh, or statistics or a bill. Um, I forgot your question. I've been thrown off. Um, no, but the use of video. No, you're, yeah, you're, so you're answering like using your image to you know these channels that circulate. You know, and it also de and it also debates the fact that when we're talking about immigration, it's not just about Latinos. Um, we are very key in putting out as many diverse. Um, Dreamers videos out there to show the picture that is not just Latinos, that is not just Mexicans, that is not just, just, mm -hmm. just you know, um, men working in on farms. Um, that it is students that are people from China, that are people from Russia. Because I think, like Madiga has said, that immigration has always been <coughs> thought of as south of the border when undocumented. Students and undocumented people have been coming from different realms of the countries. Um, Russia, we had a deportation case of a Russian student. Um, and I think that is important to single out the fact that we are dealing with a diverse immigration issue that is not just Latinos. And that this is an issue that pertains to a lot of us, a lot of our families, a lot of our friends. So, yeah, so I think it has been key to use media as an outlet and also to counter back those media outlets like Fox 5, who would, when the Sesame Street um, story came out about I was undocumented in Sesame Street, um, that, you know, although they put that story out, um, they, the comments that were left under, um, like, even if they were flagged or anything, they were still not taken off. So understanding that it's still being it's still there. You can put as much progressive article as you can and you want, but the comments still there. And acknowledging that first, uh, Fox, before you put out an article like that, acknowledge the fact that you have been calling us illegal. So even if you have give, given us a phenomenal coverage of a person who was undocumented while he was uh, an actor in Sesame Street, you're still using the word illegal in every other article or every other episode or every whatever. So I think media is very key in portraying um, immigration as, as a human issue. Um, so yeah, and coming out is very key in putting the community at first because it's not, about, it's not about media or it's not about other folks. It's about the people who are uh, facing this immigration situation. So Sonia, you are very courageous and you lead the way for lots of other people. I'm not a journalist, but I wish I were, because I could think of articles to write for you to write for all you were writers to write. Um, you know, there's immigration in my family, just like everybody else in this room. I'm not going to tell the story because it's, you know, it's, you know, it's not particularly unique. But uh, everybody's white in the family, and they came at a time when there was um, work for unskilled laborers. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a typical story. They came poor, unskilled, everybody went to school, and they moved along. Um, and that's still happening. You're absolutely right. There are plenty of people who are Ill illegal. The construction business is filled with white Irish guys. They come, they extend their visas, and they're here, and nobody seems to notice them. And I'm sure Russians and, and other white ethnic people are here, too. So this ties in with the racism. And it started in 64 when the immigration laws changed. And uh, suddenly there were more people of color coming into the country, and everybody got very upset. Um, so I think some of the articles to be written could be by the writers 
interviewing the people in their families, telling their histories about the impact of immigration, what was possible for them when they didn't have documents, and what's not possible for people whose skin is a little bit different color. Um, I, I think some of those human interest stories go a long way. And it also could get a little fire under the um, behinds of these white bourgeois journalists who don't seem to think this is important. Who are you? It's in your family. What nerve to say, I'm not interested in that. It's not a hot subject. I mean, we have to keep generations connected. And I, I don't want to get started on the school system, but they could be doing a little <laughs> bit more in helping kids learn their own and other people's history. Yeah, that is Wait, Sorry, there's a, there's a hand right here. So we'll go to you, and then if you have a question, we can. Yeah, I have a question, but uh, I wanted to say first that um, I regret missing the beginning of this uh, panel. And um, I'm in awe you know, out of the strength that I feel from uh, all of you sisters here. And uh, I'm from Canada, so we have we are contending with a different context. But I like to, uh, but I wanted to say too that uh, your st the story that you, uh, that you broke out with the, with Lou Dobbs, like I was spreading it that to my classes, to my students, they were mm -hmm. completely in awe. And then color, li color lines, I noticed that uh, I follow you guys on Twitter, and the um, the I the I word campaign is just amazing. I've been trying to spread that as much as possible among our networks, because I hear that word all the time, and and people just don't know how destructive that is. But um, we have the problem in Canada that, um, well, we don't get, we don't, I don't really know much journalists that are journalists and um, activists, and they just come to us because we work with uh, migrant workers that come through the temporary worker program. And, you know, first journalists ask for a particular type of profile. You know, there's a, a certain profile that they look for. Anything deviating from that profile, they're not interested. And, of course, they, you know, they want to, um, to talk to workers, but they don't know um, what it's like for workers to, you know, to speak about their conditions. And even though workers um, uh, have um, a documents, you know, to work there temporarily, if they speak up, they can get um, sent back to their countries the next day in a few hours and, you know, whatever flight, right? So I was wondering, what kind of tips can you offer for community groups and uh, community groups that, you know, um, journalists come to all the time without recognizing um, you know, all the difficulties uh, of workers, you know, speaking out and how when they leave the picture, when they, you know, got their story, were the ones, you know, the, the grassroots groups tr um, that assume the risk with workers. Of course, workers are always assuming um, the most risk. But, you know, because of all the problems that we had with journalists, like I prefer to run the other way fast with my, you know, hair on fire. So, and so how can we really work with the media to, for the media, for people in the media who are not activists, who are not sensitive to all of this, to make them understand or to really work with them in a constructive way to get the story out there and get workers' voices out there. Yeah, Esther and um, uh, Monica. Um, so I wanted to address your question first because we at Drop the I Word have um, a project called the I Am Storytelling Project. Um, so we want people to say, you know, I am a mother, I am a student, I am a neighbor. And we, we really think that this campaign is something that everyone can get behind. So the types of stories that you're describing are precisely what we're looking for. Um, we're hearing from um, immigrants without documents, immigrants with documents, people, people like yourself. If you're interested in telling your story through our campaign, um, if we get in touch, I think that would be great. Um, I think that... I'm not familiar with the different experiences that you've had or if people have been um, deported as a result of different coverage. But I think that when a reporter comes to you, um, reporters are just human beings, just like anybody else. So that you, you feel free to you know, unwrap the conversation in the way that is comfortable for you, in the way that's comfortable for the person that you're working with. Um, and feel free to dig into what it is that they're after. What's the story going to be like? Are they going to use the I word? You can ask them not to. Um, and I do think that there are very sensitive issues around um, people's identity when they are at risk. And unfortunately, those are some precautions that on the other end, as a PR person working with groups, I know that I have had to um, take. So one of the things that um, 
I think you talked about photographing people's hands um, or somehow masking who the person is, but still trying to bring in their humanity, I think is important. Um, so in some way, in some way showing that humanity, whether it's by their hands or um, filming them working or showing them, you know, as in their everyday, I think that's really important. Um, sometimes people use different names um, or they don't, or they, you know, don't use their last name and those are just a couple of different ways. But I think that if you aren't comfortable with the story to begin with, you can say no. <laughs> and I, I think that's important. You, you call the shot still, or it, actually the person does who's being interviewed. Um, can I all throw in a couple more things? I mean, it, it, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like mm -hmm. some reporter saying, I need a single mother who's like, yeah. yeah. And they're like, they've already written the story in their head, yeah. and they're just waiting to put your person in. Um, not good journalism, actually, but um, I mean, it partly depends. Like, if you're dealing with a beat reporter who this is part of what they're going to be covering in an ongoing way, then I think it's worth investing in that person and, like, say, come on down to our, you know, center and let's let's. Re I'd like to off the record have a conversation. Why don't you sit down? I'll get a couple of our members, or I don't know how you're structured, and, and let's really talk through the issues with you. Like, I'm happy to be of help to you, but I feel like you're not really getting, you know, there's stuff you're not understanding here, we'd like to help you understand it, and we'd like, you know, we, we, we can tell you what the stories are that you might want to be writing, and I think, you know, it really could be worth your time to bring that person along if it's not just like a one-shot thing. I mean, the other thing you can do is contact um, editors at the publication and say, like, I don't know if you're talking about daily papers or what, but say, we, you know, we'd like to meet with, with your editors, your assigning editors, and, and talk to them about, you know, we're, we're hearing from reporters in a way that's irresponsible. We'd like to talk to you about the issues facing the workers that we deal with. We'd like to talk about the cover, the issues we have with the way that you're reporting these stories. I mean, you'd be surprised at what an impact that has mm -hmm. when an advocacy group comes in and talks to editors and reporters and really raises concerns. It doesn't happen that often. And, like, it's noted, you know, and it will affect, at least for a while, <laughs> it will affect how people are thinking about things. And actually, in general, the truth is reporters and editors want good story ideas. So if part of what you're doing is saying, like, look, I'm going to tell you all the unreported stories that you really should be writing, they'll actually like, they're not stupid, they'll be quite grateful for that, actually. Any other questions from the group? Um, so I work at an international high school, it's all recent newcomers. Um, probably about like 30% of our students are undocumented. Um, and my question for Sonia is like, like, I feel like in, in my school, it's like kind of safe, you know, like I have an advisory of 10 kids, you know, three of them are undocumented and we can talk about it, you know, um, and brainstorm, you know, just their future, you know, what are their different options and stuff. Um, but I, I'm wondering like for them, like what is, like how is that gonna change once they get out of high school? Cause I feel like for a lot of our kids, it's like, it's safe in high school, you know, you're kind of protected in the public school system, especially in New York City. But like, um, like, how does that change when you leave? And and for you know you and your your uh, coworkers, co-organizers coming out on film. I mean, what are like the risks for you? I think definitely um, in high school, unfortunately, I didn't have like a high school like that. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a predominantly African American high school, and you know I had my best friends, but nobody went was going through the same situation I was. Mm -hmm. I was ashamed of what I was. I didn't want to tell them that I wasn't going to be able to go with them away for college. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hid that within me. Um, I think it would have been amazing. Even my guidance counselor, <clears throat> they didn't know how to treat it. They treated it like a disease, like they didn't want to touch mm -hmm. it. Um, like if we had, if they would have helped me done research that it would open up a can of worms. And I quote, they said, 
we're gonna open up a can of worms and we can't do it because they're acknowledging that there has been like one or two students prior to me that had an undocumented status. So I didn't have that safe ha haven like within high school. Um, but because I saw like grassroots organizations by, led by youth, um, when I went into college, I, I saw these organizations. I saw them online, I saw their blogs. I'm like, you know, where are they? Where are they in New York? Um, I was able to find uh, one, the New York State Youth Leadership Council, and it's youth-led, youth run, uh, undocumented youth uh, at the forefront, talking about everything, um, and that's that's the community you want to enter into. Um, you know, we can have allies, but at the end of the day, you know, somebody does, who does not is not undocumented doesn't know what it is to you know to be asked, you know, to turn down an internship or, you know, mm -hmm. can't go away for, to play soccer or, 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 or this, right? Um, so it's like, for me, it was harder um, when I was, I came out of high school in 2007. Around that time, um, some of like youth-led organizations were just starting up. Uh, but now we have even the new Immigrant Youth Alliance, which is an alliance of a lot of different organizations across the, the, uh, the states. So that's like the New York, the New Immigrant Youth Alliance. Um, and you can Google them. Uh, we're fairly new, but it's an uh, uh, alliance of different organizations across the states that is youth led by immigrant youth, by undocumented youth. And the communities that they have built, um, it is a safe ha haven that I would have wanted uh, when, you know, when I was growing up. Um, and it's still young. It is, you know, a rich generation. Um, like I said, it's youth-led. And that's the key point. Um, and I think, you know, you can go into the website and there's different organizations that are part of it from different states. So if you have students or a community that you're in touch in Texas, we can redirect you to uh, a community youth-led organization that can, you know, that, that, that they can be part of. In New York, you can bring it to New York State Youth Leadership Council. Um, and we open up the discussions and we have a uh, support group, uh, we have a mentoring program. <coughs> um, so there's like doing that kind of research that helps. Um, and then when it comes to sharing the stories, um, yesterday we had a rally in Union Square, uh, Monica was there speaking, um, and it was part of the National Coming Out uh, Week. Um, and 14 dreamers, uh, 14 undocumented youth, shared their story. Um, there were, I could say, 10 dreamers who did not share the story that they found via Twitter, the f via Facebook, the flyer, and they came through. Um, and on the side, they were crying. And mm. it's it is them hearing such stories, um, seeing like videos of some of the dreamers who, sh who were sharing the stories like online on YouTube. Um, that's what helps because I didn't have that when I was I was young in high school. Um, there was nobody saying, you know, I'm undocumented, but I am, you know, a human being. I am still smart, and I am still, you know, a student, and I'm, I'm a sister, and you know, I have brothers. So having that in those videos, you know, um, I think the New Immigrant Youth Alliance has been great at achieving that, um, making, I guess, a community across the states through videos, through blog posts. Um, and definitely look out for, there's a lot of undocumented um, youth journalists uh, who have been publishing articles and like, um, and even blogging about their status. And that helps, that goes a long way. Do you risk the uh, imprisonment or deportation uh, because you come out? Is that, is that possible under the law? Can they do that? Um, no. Okay. Um, I have taken a stand with undocumented youth, um, specifically those who would uh, pertain to like the DREAM Act, um, ICE has taken a stand that, you know, they don't just go after a case just because they started an article. There has to be like uh, stories behind it. I don't know. Um, we worked uh, closely with lawyers, um, and we also had the end campaign, which is to end the deportations of DREAMers, to end the deportations of undocumented youth. Um, and I do, like, you know, coming out, my parents will not come out. Um, at first, I was hesitant about using my last name because my parents are still undocumented. 
So if that was, you know, to be, you know, traced back, you know, my parents would be deported. Um, but it's taking that stand and taking that risk. My parents support me greatly. Um, and we also have the support of community organizers and lawyers. Um, and I even took a bigger risk um, last year in the, during the fall when SB 1070 passed and um, <coughs> in the summer when SB 1070 passed in Arizona and when Dream Muck was coming up, um, there was a, a lot of direct actions and civil disobediences. Um, and when civil disobedience are done by undocumented people, um, there's a heart, a, like a, a harder risk um, because you're undocumented and you can, you know, be uh, put in the system and then your case be forwarded to ICE. Um, and 21 of us from across the uh, state, one being me from New York, we got arrested in the Senate building in Washington, D.C. And our risk was that if we were to put in, deport in deportation, um, that that just highlights, like, the urgency of, of, of addressing such issues of, like, immigration being so broken and the need to pass, like, a DREAM Act. And taking those risks um, is important, but we do acknowledge that there is like a risk of coming out, and we train like our whoever's coming out, we train them, um, and we have like one-on-one -on -one workshops, and and it's, it's the key word is being informed, but also being courageous and safe. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go to other people who haven't spoken. Sorry. Yeah. Um, do you with law stands in terms of? Uh, Making it easier for people to become uh, American citizens because I heard that they move been to make that happen, but I, I don't know where where things stand. Where, uh, is there bills in play right now to try and make it easier? Do you know where that stands now? I mean, in terms of immigration right now, there's tons of SB 1070 passed. Um, that was like a test bill, um, opening up a can of worms. I'm gonna use that again. Um, in Florida, they tried to pass something I think similar where they're only going after immigrants, undocumented immigrants who are not white immigrants. So if you fit that profile, okay, who fits that profile? People of color, right? Um, so they make it clear who they're going after. Um, we have in Georgia, we have in North Carolina, that they're trying to ban undocumented students in enrolling into college. Um, but in a response to that, there are bills that are coming up. DREAM Act uh, was not able to pass in the federal level, but there are states close. close. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we are working um, this year, we're working within our states. So New York has launched the campaign to pass the New York State DREAM Act. Um, and that is led by my organization, the New York State Youth Leadership Council. Um, in Maryland, you know, if you have been uh, paying attention, we're like winning in states like Maryland and you know, in California as well, like another version of the DREAM Act, um, um, including like talking about like financial aid for undocumented uh, youth. So there's concert like um, acts, um, but as of now, I think that, you know, post elections, post immigration, if it's not like acknowledged by McCain or if it's not about, you know, you know killing illegals, through a helicopter or something like that. <laughs> it's not being addressed, and that's like that's the failure in it. Um, but share me, and, and you can quote me, um, immigrant movements um, are always working. And even though they're not being portrayed in media, they are grassroots. We're doing 24-7, um, we're students, but we're able to still manage that. Um, so we're still working, and there's always bills. Um, and specifically if you're in New York, there's a lot of things that are coming up, um, and there's also work to be done against secure communities. So, yeah, I think we're in a very difficult place with immigration, but there's hope. I think there's a, a lot of hope, and, and, and what's been happening is that the path to citizenship, which was part of you know, like the more humane pieces of legislation, has been completely taken down for now. And, like you were saying, especially South Carolina, like the most likely states are South Carolina, Kansas with this guy, uh, Florida to pass very similar legislation pieces as in um, Arizona. Hi, hi everyone, thank you. Uh, hi, Sonia, I, I have a question. How do you feel about the, the trimming down of uh, the Senate for uh, about the, the Dream Act? Because I've been following since a long time, since it began. 
And I think that the, at the beginning was like a very generous, generous package they were offering people, and now it's like they are cutting, cutting, cutting. And now it looks like it's almost like they feel like they are doing you a favor. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's mm. it's very annoying for me. And and at, at the other day, the last time they tried to pass it, I said I don't support this. I don't want to support mm. this because this is like an insult for immigrants to to give. Just like a, you know, like yeah. a favor, like you're doing a favor, and it's unfair. Yeah, it's definitely like um, I think one of the things that we have to also acknowledge is the fact that there has not been bills for immigrants. It's always about enforcing the border. It's always about building more uh, detention centers. It's about more criminalization. And I think Dream Act has opened the way into like it is about you know a humane bill um, that it it promotes you know the immigrant person that it you know acknowledges their skills that acknowledges their potential and what they can offer right um and definitely towards the end dream act of course um that would have been like a piece of legislation that um would have been, <coughs> if passed would have been pro-immigrant um something that has never happened that hasn't come up uh in a in a, in a few i guess pretty long years mm -hmm. um so just acknowledging that I understand they put an age cap on that. They eliminated community service, um, but it, we're dealing with politicians, and we're dealing with um, you know elections coming up. And you know McCain was a supporter of the Dream Act, and then he he co-sponsored it, and um, you know a few years ago, and then you know elections comes up, you know, and no, we don't want you know Dreamers, we don't do, we don't want Dream Act, um, but I think. We have acknowledged that um, grassroots have acknowledged that, um, and and I quote and I will quote one of the um, founders of my organization, Jose Luis. He would not be able to, I guess, um, use the Dream Act if had passed because he doesn't make the age cap. He aged out. Fortunately, he's 30 years old now. He was involved for. Uh, for six years now uh, with the Dream Act campaign, but he ages out now. Um, but he understands that it still um, answers a pool of, of dreamers, of undocumented students, and that's key, to push a legislator that opens a discussion. And I think that has mm -hmm. what Dream Act has done. It has opened a discussion, it has opened a platform, um, and we're now holding accountable like those senators that did not you know, stand in our favor. And of course, we want a better, you know, version of Dream Act, uh, and we have always been pushing that. Um, we always said that at a point that, you know, it looked that, you know, if a new Dream Act is introduced um, this year, that it is not something that reflective of our communities, something respectful, that we will never support it, even though it might have to say Dream Act, we will <laughs> never support it, and that's the understanding that, you know. That we, those organizations um, organizing and campaigning for the Dream Act, that we have agency and we can turn something like that down, uh, and we will disapprove it. So, yeah. But I think carrying it on is just that it has opened a platform to immigration discussion and a pro like pro immigrant bill, um, humane and and not enforcing or criminalizing. Everybody, I don't know if there's any closing thoughts. It's six fifty right now. Um, any quick closing thoughts for folks? Don't forget to text. Is that right? I think I don't know. Yeah, it's the I word. It's yeah. join the campaign. Six nine eight six six, and it's I word. Yeah. Just all one word, no it's, hyphen. Yeah, no hyphen. Not the X. I did that. Just I didn't like it. So uh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I? Thank you.